what are the 1,000 watt to about 3,000 watt ZVS induction heaters good for? First, let's look at processes that these 1,000 watt to about 3,000 watt ZVS induction heaters can do well. Then I will mention a few things that work to some degree and finally list a few processes that I really don't recommend for this class or size of induction heater. First, processes that these heaters do well. You can melt many of the non-ferrous metals up to about one to one and a half pounds using a graphite crucible. One guy that I saw made a nice temperature controlled solder pot well within the power of even a 1000 watt unit to melt a pound of lead or two of, of solder or two. Examples of materials that melt well are copper, aluminum, gold, silver, lead, tin, brass, and most bronzes. A second item that works very well is to anneal brass cartridge casing necks. A third process that works well is to anneal copper tubing and other non-ferrous metals with some fixed ring or within a graphite or steel cylinder. Note that the work coil will need to be sized to fit the tubing in most cases, or really to fit just about anything in most cases. You can also use these heaters to anneal steel things that fit into the work coil. I would say things like uh, knife blades uh, that will again fit into the coil and will get up to the Curie temperature which is typically a 15 to 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. I think you can heat treat small steel items. This goes for both hardening and tempering. Of course tempering generally only requires temperatures below a thousand degrees so you can get just about any steel thing that you can get into the coil to glow which is typically around 900 degrees Fahrenheit. But as far as hardening goes uh, you need to have a tight enough uh, magnetic bond between the work coil and the work to get over the Curie temperature uh, to the hardening temperature of the particular material that you're trying to harden. You can brass or bronze braze just about anything small enough to fit into the work coil where at least one part of the assembly contains iron as long as the copper content of the braze material isn't too high. I think that you could braze with pure copper if the work coil is carefully designed to fit the workpiece. But here, you know, you're depending upon the ferrous material to actually heat the joint up to the point where the brazing material, whatever it is, melts. So if you can't get the iron or the iron bearing part of the material up to copper melting temperatures, of course, you're not going to be able to braze with really high copper stuff. One example of doing this would be brazing cutters like carbide inserts onto steel shanks for lathe tools and other machine cutting tools. I have even melted a small amount of cast iron using a graphite crucible. Of course the cast iron being iron reaches the curie point and typically the current drops off significantly so it's really hard to get to melting temperature without some help from uh, something like carbon, graphite, what have you that keeps the current up. The eighth thing that these things do meh, moderately well would be to forge small items, but here it's generally going to require special coils. Yes, you can get them red hot uh, and maybe a little bit of an orange glow, but that generally implies anywhere from maybe 12 to maybe 1700 degrees Fahrenheit or something like that. And yes, you can forge those materials at that temperature but I think if you were going to really do any serious blacksmithing, you'd want to be able to get up to at least 22, 2300 degrees. So you've got time uh, on your side when you're actually banging with a hammer. The hammer and the anvil both cooling the material, as I'm sure you well know. I can heat 
uh, about one pound of steel well beyond the curie point if it is a solid uh, piece of material well insulated all around and a snug fit into the, into the work coil. So that one pound I think I've gotten as high as uh, maybe 1200 degrees Celsius. Okay, and this is maybe offbeat a little bit, and you could do this with about any heat source. But there's a real cool trick for making holes in fiberglass without cracking it by drilling. Use the induction heater to heat a rod of the needed diameter. Then press the tip of the rod into the plexiglass. This method produces much more predictable results, that is, no cracking, than with drill bits. And lastly for now, the induction heater would be great for loosening stuck fasteners where the heater's coil can be gotten close to the part to be heated. I could see making a flexible uh, coil. I could see making a flexible coil wand if needed. www.metalworks spelled m e t t l e w o r k s dot com does sell such a wand for a bit less than two hundred dollars. This process of heating a rusted nut or the end of a bolt with the induction heater uh, doesn't require you to actually get the part red hot, although that often helps. But what you have to do is to be able to get the coil down over the nut or bolt enough to get it to at least smoking pretty good before things really start to happen, as, for instance, the rust starts to break down. Now we're going on to a couple things where it does a pretty good job of heating steel tubing whose OD is close to the work coil ID. With that in mind, the machine would be good for stretching or flaring many kinds of tubing, for instance, making candle cups for a blacksmith out of steel. Again, the coil would have to be designed to be good for stretching or flaring many kinds of tubing, for instance, making candle cups for a blacksmith out of steel. Again, the coil would have to be designed to be close to the, uh, uh, a close fit with the tubing. And here's uh, one where careful coil design and some experimentation may allow you to do this. Getting steel bars over one half inch square or round up to a good forging temperature you'd need to find the smallest diameter coil that you can uh, that, that closely fits the stock that you're going to heat. You get the work as hot as you can get it and uh, I, I, I think again some experimentation with with the coil design would be really important here. And it really, if you're going to do any of the things that I've talked about, if you don't have an amp meter in series with the DC power, you're going to run into trouble sooner or later. So you might as well do that right off the bat. Here are things that the ZVS induction heaters, 1,000 to 3,000 watt, does poorly at. This class of induction heater is not good for general blacksmith forging, in my opinion. You need about 7,000 watts for this purpose. This need is met pretty well with the so-called 15KW units that are sold by many people on eBay, Amazon, and Chinese vendors for about a thousand dollars plus or with for about a thousand dollars. Sometimes shipping can be another 300 or so. You will also need a pressurized water cooling system for these devices and uh, typically uh, that uh, water cooling unit is going to cost you about another 400 bucks. Well, there you have it. I hope this video gives you enough information about this class of 1000 watt to 3000 watt ZVS induction heaters so you can make an informed decision about buying one for yourself.